agenda today. So please make me welcome uh, Minister Mark Woods. Well, thanks very much, Alan, for that warm welcome. And also acknowledge Jeff Gibson, the Chair of Tourism Australia, Andrew McAvoy, the CEO, the Secretary of my Department, Drew Clark, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. And at the outset, I'd also like to express our appreciation to Arnie Agnes for the very warm welcome of the country, and in doing so, pay my respects to the number of our elders, both past and present. And also, potentially give an apology. Um, unfortunately, unlike you today, I do not have access to electronic voting. If a particular bell rings, then I've got to move very quick, otherwise I'll be on the map before the week. <laughs> Putting that aside, my friends, can I first and say, well, firstly, welcome to Canberra, and more importantly, welcome to the second, Australian, second annual Australian Tourism Directions Conference. This conference is obviously an initiative of the National Long-Term Tourism Strategy, and its objective is simple. Deliver, to deliver market-leading information, sector analysis and industry assessment. The program has very clearly been designed to challenge industry and to encourage debate and audience participation. So let's start with an overall analysis of the industry. By now, many of you will have taken the opportunity to absorb the 2011 State of the Industry Report in detail. Those looking for a good assessment or a bad one will be disappointed. You and I know the reality is far more complex. I think it's fair to say that a lot has happened since I spoke at the inaugural Tourism Directions Conference in November of last year. In December, we experienced the Oprah effect. Before the shows even aired in 145 countries, the investment of $5 billion by government had paid for itself many times over. And although Oprah unfortunately cannot fix the US economy, I remind you that thanks to the leadership of Tourism Australia and its excellent work, more than 86,800 media stories about Oprah's ultimate Australian experience generated 380 million in free promotion for Tourism Australia. Then we were struck by the first of two natural disasters in Australia, the Queensland floods and Cyclone Yassin. Together, they are unfortunately wiped. 1.4 billion of total visitor expenditure in the March quarter 2011, compared with the previous March quarter. We then had the unfortunate international disasters, the Japanese and New Zealand earthquakes and the Chilean volcanic ash cloud, which further impacted the industry. Although the Japanese market has been gradually falling since its peak of 1996, Arrivals plummeted by 18% in the first eight months of this year. Fortunately for Australia, this next century is the Asian century. And I welcome Australia's former ambassador to China, Jeff Ray, who will address the conference with respect to this issue. A remarkable shift occurred within our international tourism market in the September quarter of last year. This cannot go unmarked even though it went largely unnoticed by those outside the sector. China surpassed the United Kingdom as Australia's most valuable tourism market, with its value now being on 3.4 billion per year. Last financial year alone, there were 475,000 Chinese visitors to Australia, an incredible 26% more than the previous year. In many ways, Australia is turning to face not just China, but other near neighbours. It is envisaged that there will be visitor spending levels well over 1 billion per annum, each from India, South, South Korea and Malaysia by the end of the decade. Accordingly, the Australian Government and Tourism Australia will invest over $55 million in 2011-12, telling the world that there's nothing like Australia, with appropriately significant investments in China, Japan and Korea. We will maintain our investment in Australia's traditional high yield markets, such as the United States, United Kingdom and New Zealand, which continue to be important despite their domestic economic challenges. International arrivals are forecast to grow by 3.4% a year to reach 8.1 million by 2020. In that context, Australia's air capacity is increasing appropriately to accommodate this growth. 
airlines such as China Southern recently announced increased services, doubling the daily direct flights into Melbourne to two, adding an extra flight per week into Brisbane, taking a total of four, and introducing three a week into Perth from November of this year. Seat capacity between China and Australia is estimated to quadruple to more than 2.4 million seats by 2020. Obviously, the state of the industry reports also must highlight the challenges confronting us in the domestic tourism industry. Increased national wealth and a higher Australian dollar mean that more and more Australians are heading overseas. At the same time, households are also changing the way they spend their income, focusing on paying down their mortgages and other debts and directing more and more money into paying for new services like mobile phones and paid television. Despite this, domestic tourism has secured a 43 billion share of the consumer purse, 1% more than last year, and visitor nights are also up 0.3% Australia-wide. The real challenge though will be getting those international visitors into the region. Whereas UK visitors spend 39% of their nights outside the gateway cities, Chinese visitors only spend 18%. Attractions such as the impressive Chinese Golden Dragon Museum that I saw last week in video, and the winemaker's plan to improve cellar door experiences, are just two examples of how work is being undertaken by state and regional tourism organisations to lure visitors to regions in association with the work of Tourism Australia. Well, let's go to some of the challenges. Australians are obviously travelling overseas in record numbers. Um, while this is a factor of the whole, whole high Australian dollar, so is a key driver called wealth in Australia. Australians have seen a 29% increase in average real disposable income from a household point of view since 2000. The rapid industrialisation of China, Indomites and India is creating unprecedented demand for Australia's resources and rapid expansion of our minerals and energy sectors. Industries such as tourism will continue to face intense competition for labour. As the Australian, labor, as the Australian Tourism Labor Force report we are releasing today shows, there are at least 35,000 tourism and hospitality vacancies currently across Australia, which is expected to grow to 56,000 by 2015. Growth in tourism investment is much lower than for growth in Australian investment overall. For the period 2000-2001 to 2019, investment growth in tourism was only 3.9%, compared to 7.3% for the overall economy. Right now, while the industry is getting back on its feet, we're facing a challenge of another kind. The inconvenient displacement of travellers as a result of the industrial action by unions against Qantas. Ladies and gentlemen, airlines such as Qantas and Virgin are fundamental to the viability of Australian tourism operators, both big and small. Combined, and we should never forget this, they move more than 41,500 passengers to 60 cities and regional destinations on more than 5,600 flights per week from Melbourne to Mine and Mount Isaac and from Darwin to Devonport. Like the tourism industry, government wants all parties to reach a resolution and settle their disputes as quickly as possible. It is in the best interest of union members and their families, Qantas, and the inconvenienced Australian traveller who depend on fast and reliable air services to reverse our vast continent for both business and leisure. Just as important are the businesses and their employees whose incomes directly or indirectly depend upon the smooth functioning of our air travel system. I would note, however, that in terms of the potential for government intervention, there is no need for any amendments to the Fair Work Australia Act. The Act already provides that in exceptional circumstances, industrial action that has wider implications than for just one business can be suspended or terminated if it threatens significant damage to the economy or to the welfare or safety of the population. Clearly, 
if the dispute goes on for much longer, industry will appropriately continue to fend up reaction with my support, I might say, and the government will be required to consider potential actions available under the existing Act. But let's go to where we go from here. What lies ahead for Australia's 34 billion tourism sector and its almost 500,000 directly employed workers. As we move beyond these foundation years with our microeconomic reform agenda, the industry can expect to see even more outcomes from the national long-term tourism strategy. We must continue to invest in tourism skills and labour with more initiatives like the Pacific Seasonal Worker Program pilot in Broome, with workers from East Timor expected to begin in February of next year. The government will also back the industry with labour agreements for front of house workers, simple to use guides to engage 457 visa workers, and regional migration plans for areas such as Esperance and Darwin. Just yesterday, we announced the extension of the work and holiday visa to Papua New Guinea, and we need to keep working on options for increased recruitment and retention of chefs. We can expect to see more of the great success the Indigenous Land Council has achieved as is what recent acquisition. 34 Indigenous people have been employed at the resort. The ILC claims to employ 350 Indigenous Australians at the resort by 2018 are far cry from the two Indigenous workers employed when they first took out of the resort just a matter of a couple of months ago. We can expect to see a rapid uptake of the T-Quad accreditation program, given the T-Quad will soon feature in the world's first partnership with TripAdvisor, the largest travel site in the world. Increased investment in tourism will come from reducing upfront regulatory costs and barriers to investment. I'm therefore pleased to note that planning reform has been included in a recent release consultation paper in COAG's Business Regulation and Competition Working Group, identifying possible further reform priorities under COAG's ongoing seamless national economy initiative. I encourage industry to support this call by raising the issue with relevant state and local government authorities. You must drive it with the support of the Commonwealth. We will also continue to work with the Department of Transport towards increasing aviation access and I will soon join industry representatives in Nanjing next month for Tourism Australia's great, Greater China Travel Mission, giving industry direct access to travel agents, tour operations, media and airlines from the region. Last week we announced the extension to tourism of the Enterprise Connect program using funding from the Two Wild Freaks program. Tourism businesses have productivity which is below the national average. Enterprise Connect hopefully provides access to a network of experienced business advisors to help firms improve their supply chain, management structures, workforce systems and export strategies. And in doing so, assist firms to compete through distinct products and services rather than solely on price. And finally, with 62% of international travellers to Australia in 2010 using the internet for information, and 42% for travel bookings, we cannot afford to ignore the power of the mouse. The Tourism E-Kit and the National Online Strategy for Tourism will be a business one click away from their customers. Ladies and gentlemen, can I say in conclusion? Tomorrow I will meet with my ministerial <coughs> colleagues at the Tourism Minister's Council meeting here in Canberra. The governments we represent will spend a combined $652 million on tourism marketing in this year alone, some 9.3% more than last year. But governments cannot do it alone. <coughs> the opportunities are there for the industry to invest, to lift productivity, to access staff, to gain help with training, and to get exposure to domestic and international markets while buying into the key employments. I will continue to call round tables, pulling into those round tables other portfolio representatives to try and facilitate access by tourism providers to the range of other government programs, be it support for skilling, apprenticeships or migration, as we have in recent months. That's our opportunity 
to engage at a cap level and to ensure that we access every available opportunity to support this industry. I simply say that the portfolio sectors I represent, resources, energy and tourism, account for more than 60% of Australia's goods and service exports. We should never forget that. You are a key part of the Australian economy. I look forward to continuing to work together, which is contributing to the current strength and resilience of the industry, and I thank you for your commitment and determination of what was yet another challenging performance. All the very best for the successful conference. Thank you.